Good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Welcome you to the April 10, 2014 meeting of the City County Planning Board. If you would please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Today's meeting is being broadcast live by TV 13. It will be rebroadcast at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, again at 4 p.m. Sunday afternoon. Our first order of business today will be the consent agenda. These are items for which the petitioner has requested a continuance or withdrawal, or items for which the planning board or staff has recommended approval and no one signs up to speak in opposition. For our public hearings today, each side will have a total of 12 minutes. There is no rebuttal period. Once the public hearing is closed and the board goes into work session, no one will be permitted to speak unless a board member asks a question. For general use district zoning, the planning board must consider the full range of uses allowed in the district, so the petitioner may not refer to a specific use. For special use zoning, however, you must be very specific about the uses and how the site will be developed. Items under Section B of our agenda require final approval by either the city, county, or the county commissioners. As such, votes taken today are recommendations that go to those bodies for their deliberation. Uh, before addressing the board today, if, you, if you're commenting, we need your name, address, and the zip code for the record, please. And also, I'd remind you to mute any cell phones you have with you right now. Uh, first order or, uh, is the uh, approval of the minutes of the March 13 and March 24 meetings. Any corrections or additions to those Good minutes? Approval. Motion by Mr. Mulligan. Second. Second by Ms. Mitchell. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Now call on Aaron King to present our consent agenda. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, the first item on the consent agenda is item B3, it's only docket W3213. And this is a request to rezone about 5.4 acres at the corner of Oak Summit and um, uh, Germanton Road there, that's at the corner where McCulloch Tile is. Um, about 90% of that property is already HB. As you can see on that location map, there is just a small piece that is RS9 over in that northwest corner. So this would um, make the complete, all of the properties on HB, and staff recommends approval of this general use request. Okay. No one signed up in opposition. Is anyone here opposed to this recommendation? Seeing none, we're declared the public hearing closed. No approval. Second. second. Motion Mr. Lamb, second Mr. Younger. <coughs> Discussion. <coughs> All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is B4. It's uh, <coughs> docket W3214. And this is a request to rezone about 57 acres at the intersection of Indiana and University from RM18 LO <coughs> and RS9 to RM18. As you can see, we have some, some squirrely looking zoning lines on that site now. Um, about the, major the majority of this site as well is, uh, is zoned to RM18, which is a little bit of LO over towards uh, University and a little bit of RS9 over in the north and northeast corner. Um, this is adjacent to Salem Town's existing campus, which is RM18S. Um, so this would, again, uh, make this entire property zoned to RM18. And staff does recommend approval of this uh, general use request. Anyone here opposed to this recommendation? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Move approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Lamb, second by Ms. Mitchell in discussion. All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is B5. It's uh, W3215, and this is a request to rezone about 9.7 acres from RS9 to RM18S, and this is at the southern terminus of Stafford Place uh, Boulevard. Uh, you can see, um, just to get you oriented, uh, Stafford Village Boulevard, Boulevard is to the north. <clears throat> Peters Creek is over to the east, and you can see the MRBS there at the corner. Um, that's the Walmart um, store. Um, this, it's kind of oriented sideways now, is sort of a continuation of the um, Stafford Place apartments that have been built to the north in the MUS zoning. It would extend Stafford Place uh, Boulevard into the site. Uh, most of the buildings are, are clustered um, up to the, to the north into the middle of the site. And just one other point um, to make because I know we're going to get into street connectivity later on on the agenda. Um, there is a stub of Alexander Preston Lane that comes into the property. You can kind of see it there where the mouse is. 
Um, the UDO requires stub connections to be made into the property, and it gives three exceptions for that not to be made. One of those is extenuating topography or creeks. And if you look in the corner of the site plan, you can see Alexander Preston Lane where it ends right there, and you can see a creek running through the corner of that property. What you don't see on this map is um, quite a bit of extenuating topography. So we reviewed this with the engineering department. They've agreed it's not feasible to make that connection without um, unreasonable cost. So just wanted to point that out for, for later discussion. But staff does recommend approval of this rezoning request. Okay. Anyone here opposed to this recommendation? Say none. We'll close the public hearing. Move approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Lamb. Second by Ms. Mitchell. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Oh, sorry. There were the elevations. Forgot. Forgot they were on there. Uh, next item is B6. It's uh, docket F1545. Um, this is to re uh, request to rezone about 29 acres from RS40 to RS15S. This is on the east side of Lasseter Road, uh, just north of Peace Haven. It's kind of uh, sandwiched on about three sides by the Waterford subdivision. Uh, the developers requested a one-month continuance on this to try to work with the neighbors and work out some other design issues. They got their request in prior to the automatic continuance deadline, so it is an automatic one-month continuance, and no vote is needed on this one. Next item <coughs> is B7, <coughs> docket W1852. Uh, and this is a final development plan for uh, an HBS site. It's located south of Haynes Mill Road um, and east of University Parkway. Uh, the Walmart on uh, this part of town sits just out of the screen to the north. Currently, there's a car wash on the site, and the request is for a proposed Zaxby's restaurant. Um, this is a little different than most final development plans where uh, planning board is the final approval authority. Um, this actually has to be approved by city council, so it will go up to them after this meeting. And staff does recommend approval of this request. Anyone here opposed to this recommendation? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. We have approval. Second. Motion, Mr. Lamb. Second, Mr. Mulligan. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. The next item <clears throat> is item C1, and this is a planning board review 2014-3. Um, just wanted to know this is the first time we've, we've done location maps and we actually spruced up the staff report to add a little bit more information so I hope the board found that helpful this month. Um, this is for about a little under an acre on the north side of Humphrey Street um, close to the future research parkway there. This is for utilities and more specifically a Duke Power substation. Um, staff has reviewed this and it does meet uh, ordinance requirements and we would recommend approval of this request. Move approval. Second. Motion Mr. Lamb. Second Mr. Mulligan. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is C2. It's PBR 2014-4. Um, and this is a request for 1.19 or 1.91 acres on the east side of Northgate Park Drive. <coughs> this is for Habilitation Facility C. You can see there the existing uh, buildings in the location map and also sort of mirrored on the, uh, the site plan there. No real changes proposed other than delineating the required recreation area. Um, this does meet UDO requirements, and staff does recommend approval. Move approval. Second. Motion, Mr. Lamb. Second, Mr. Mulligan. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. And the last item is item D1. It's a minor subdivision exception request. Um, this is over in the Blues Creek area. You may remember this started back in 2013. It's we, We've had it on the agenda for a while. It's been continued a couple of times. Um, the petitioner sent us a request for withdrawal of this, asking for it to be withdrawn. So um, it has been. There's no vote needed by the board, just more of an informational piece for the board. So that concludes the, uh, the consent agenda. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we're going to be talking about request W3211. Uh, this was continued from February's meeting to today. Uh, the petitioner is the 
<coughs> excuse me, is the Moose Lodge. Uh, the site is located on Old Salisbury Road on the west side, just north of Gear Road Drive. It's about 1.65 acres. And they are requesting special use rezoning from RS9 to GBS. Um, their original request had a few more uses than are listed on this slide. Uh, I can't remember the exact number. But they have been dropped since then. This is to show you that the site is located in GMA 3. And here is a location map. Um, this, for the benefit of the people in the audience, this green hatched area that you see is where the notices went to um, surrounding property owners about this rezoning request. And then this is our aerial. Um, you can see that, by and large, the surrounding districts are residential. Um, there is a little bit of commercial in the office up here in the corner. Once you get to Brewer, but these sites are right next to Peters Creek Parkway, which is a major thoroughfare. This is our area plan map. Um, the South Suburban Area Plan actually highlights this specific site um, as a special land use condition area. And so it talks about later in the plan um, certain conditions that they would see at this particular site. And I will talk about some of those later. This is the eastern edge of the site looking north on Old Salisbury Road. This is at the same location but looking <coughs> to south. Um, that building is the basically the reason why the petitioners asked to rezone the property. Um, it's not conforming in the current district based on the uses. And then this is a photo of that building. And then this is looking north um, at the Moose Lodge. This is a property to the east directly across the street. It's undeveloped, um, but is owned residential. Here is our site plan. It might be a little tough for you to see. I'm going to highlight a few things for you. Um, this is the building um, where the petitioner is requesting those uses. I'm not sure if that's any better. <laughs> and these are the buffer yards. They're required a um, type 4 buffer yard. And they actually propose to close a driveway that currently goes through there um, right here. And then this spot right here, um, the petitioner will have to go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment for a variance um, because there's not enough space to meet the buffer yard requirement. And so staff's analysis is basically this. South Suburban Area Plan talks about commercial uses being detrimental to the residential character of that area. Um, and specifically, as I mentioned, in the special land use conditions <coughs> page, recommends against non-residential zoning. Um, relative to the amount of residential zoned land around it, this site is pretty small um, and doesn't, in our opinion, provide any essential services to neighbors. Um, and based on our experience, these are kind of characteristic of illegal spot zoning. Um, we recognize that the building is non-residential and it might be infeasible to develop residential, um, to have residential development in that location, but 
there are other districts that are more compatible with the surrounding residential uses. Um, we feel that the GB district is so intense as to be incompatible with the rest of the uses in that area. And so we recommend denial of this request, but the site plan does meet UDO requirements. Okay. All right, thank you. Any questions of staff at this time? What would be some of the typical permitted uses in you know, in B and IP? Just some of the, there would be, just some, well, let's see, what would be some of the uses that you think would be okay in in o, NB or IP? I know that's not what they're going for, but I'm just trying to get a sense of, you made, you made the statement, so. Probably looking more at like office uses, service uses, um, even some of the retail uses, but that really aren't geared towards some of the, the, the motor vehicle uses like you see in this list. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, this is a public hearing. Uh, remind you, we have 12 minutes total for each side. Uh, Randall Kale. Okay. Get up. Come forward and give us your name, address, and zip code for the record, if you would, please, sir. <clears throat> okay, David is going to speaking. I'm just here to provide backup. Okay. Right. My name is David Gibby. I'm the manager for the Winston Salem Moose Lodge. As he noted in excuse, here, excuse me, we do need your address, please, sir. And address 1490 or 1620 Winsong Court, Winston Salem, North Carolina, 27127. Thanks, sir. I actually live about a block across the street from this property, and I manage this property. The reason we're trying to rezone it is to use the building that was built by Forsyth County Rescue Squad. That's what this building was. They had an indefinite lease on it when they were there, unless they disbanded. They disbanded about four years ago, five years ago, so we in turn got the building back. In trying to rent this building now, we're just trying to get it rezoned so we can rent it out so it doesn't sit there empty and we pay for the space. We just want to do this one and a half acres. The reason. Well, you've seen on the site plan, the reason it's a little more than the building is that land is all on one level. Behind that area, it drops off into the woods, and that's why we sectioned off this one use. We would like to rent it out to a manufacturing and motorcycle building company that's going to rebuild Harley-Davidson's. If that doesn't work, we could use it as offices, warehouse space, something to provide an income without the building sitting there empty. Our only other choice is just to pay for it to sit there empty. 80% of the money we make goes to charity. We're a 501c3. You know, Special Olympics, Safe Surfing, they get 80% of our money. Last year, 2013 years, $80,000. So we just want to keep up the work that we're doing. We, have, so we know that our 10 and a half acres now is zoned RS9. We've got 750 members. We've got 100 people that come down there on a weekly basis. This property that we're trying to rent out is basically internet sales. They hardly have any foot traffic. As that there's probably video by the city or by someone to see how much traffic they have. It's probably less. There's three people that work there. If, if they have five people drive in that lot a day, that would probably be it the most. We we'll try to rent it to somebody that keeps everything inside, won't be any trash left outside, <clears throat> and doesn't have a lot of foot traffic. That's our intent. We've got somebody in there now that's renting it, so we're just trying to conform so that we can get the money from the rent. Y'all have any questions? Any questions? Your user are going to be, <coughs> they got a dyno to test? They know that. They have no dyno and they do no motor work. Okay. They use a local, another motorcycle, but <coughs> Kendall Johnson Custom does all their motor work. They have no, no dyno and they do no motor work. <coughs> Oil changes would be about the bet first thing they did with any type of fluid or anything. Okay. Ms. Mitchell, you have a question? Yeah, and you had a neighborhood meeting on the 29th. How well attended was that and how'd that go? I was there to represent the lodge, and I think we had six, 
six or seven people from the community. I think Gyro Drive has a community <coughs> development or a community area that they had six or seven people present there once we spoke. I, th I thought it went real well once we told them of the five or six uses we wanted to use it as. They thought we wanted, you know, there was more uses, but warehousing, office space, manufacturing A being the first one, uh, car wash, anything to do with the, it's a garage type building. So whatever we could go in that, we don't want to have to build, a, we don't want to build anything. We just want to use what's there. We understand if we get it rezoned, we may have to bring some of the electrical, some of the water up to code, you know, from when it was built. It was built by, for South County Rescue Squad, so most of it's pretty well up to code. I mean, I've never drilled a hole in a wall and it filled up four foot in the ground with fire retardant. That whole building is built like that. So whatever we need to do to bring it up, we'll do it. We just want to use what's there. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Anyone else like to speak in support of this? Seeing none, and we'll turn to the opposition. Uh, first person signed up is Laura Garner. Laura <coughs> Garner? Yeah. Hi. My name is Laura Garner. My address is 1768 Gyro Drive, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, 27127. I am a long-term resident. I actually, um, my family, my parents, lived in the house that I live in now, and I am raising my children in the same house after they passed. Um, so I have lived there with multi-generations for years. Um, I'm here, I have circulated a petition that you all have on your desk, and you can see there's a two-page petition there with um, some signatures of people um, on our street. There are many long-term residents on our street. Um, I am concerned most about the commercial uh, label. And I am very fearful that this is going to, um, can, this is going to compromise our rural environment. Um, although we do live in the city, although we do live in the city, we are a tucked away um, area that has many farms, actually working farms, that people are taking off on their taxes for hay, for goats, for many other animals. Um, and so we're just kind of concerned um, about this. I wanted to show you what our, this is what our street looks like. This is also, this, this land backs up to, um, some of this land actually backs up to the Moose Lodge. This is a hundred year old house in our neighborhood. So we're mostly concerned about our residents and any type of outside traffic that might come with that. We're worried about litter. We're worried about <coughs> foot traffic. We're worried about the safety of our residents. Um, if it were to become commercial, that is our main concern, um, <coughs> outside traffic to the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Greg uh, Flieger? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Flieger. I reside at 1752 Gyro Drive, 27127. Uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes here. Uh, I too was born and raised at the address I live at now. Uh, my parents purchased a home in 1961, so I've got 53 years there. Uh, I'd like to just take a couple of minutes and speak on uh, crime, the possibilities and uh, what we have right now in the area. Uh, from January 1 of 2014 through March the 20th of 2014, police have responded uh, to 48 different incidents in this 79-day period. Uh, this was 
this is within a 2,000 foot radius of the Moose Lodge 1495 Old Salisbury Road property. Uh, now out of this, 24 of these incidents were on Peters Creek Parkway from Trademark Boulevard to the Goodwill. Exactly half a business oriented area. What I'm afraid of and what our residents are afraid of is if this 1.65 acres becomes zoned for business, what is going to stop the Moose Lodge from requesting two or three years down the road the other nine acres? Open up a strip mall, what have you, whatever kind of business could go in there. We I see what, you know, the crime stats are from the Winston-Salem Police Department in a business zoned area and I know what we have in our residential area and I'm afraid that if you open the door and allow these people to get their general business rezoning that it will make it that much easier for the other nine acres to be rezoned at a later date. Uh, so I respectfully request that you do not allow this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Highsmith? <clears throat> Hi there. I'm Carolyn Highsmith, the limit 3335 Anderson Drive, 27127. And I'm here uh, today on behalf of the New South Community Coalition and as a former member of the South Suburban Area Plan Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, supporting the Edgewood neighborhood, which is the Gyro uh, Drive neighbors, and their opposition of the Moose Lodge's request to rezone 1.65 acres located at uh, Old Salisbury Road from residential to general business special use. In 2009-2010, the Citizens Advisory Committee of the South Suburban Area Plan had protracted discussions about keeping the rural neighborhood character and integrity of the Edgewood neighborhood located off of Old Salisbury Road intact from the encroachment of commercial business coming from the Peters Creek Parkway area. A compromise was reached to consider future proposed land use along this area of Old Salisbury Road as special use, meaning that any future development would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis with, with special emphasis on keeping all of the current residential zoning intact. Plus, at that time, the Moose Lodge land area had been zoned residential since 1959 and was not considered at, at risk for commercial rezoning since it was a non-profit fraternal organization. So it came as somewhat of a shock to learn with this rezoning case that the Moose Lodge wanted to rezone their entire 10.5 acres to general business before revising their zoning request to the current 1.65 acres, especially since this property is surrounded by residential zoning. The Edgewood neighbors have also learned that the Moose Lodge has been conducting different non-conforming business enterprises out of the former rescue uh, squad building since 2007, including the latest motorcycle enterprise as of January 2014. The South Suburban Area Plan specifically states that non-residential zoning is not recommended at this location, especially for inappropriate commercial uses. This uh, W. Uh, W3211 zoning request is also an example of illegal spot zoning. So permitting a commercial business enterprise on this property would be detrimental to the surrounding residential neighborhoods and in total opposition of the South Suburban Area Plan. So in conclusion, the New South Community Coalition supports the Planning Department's recommendation for denial of W. Uh, of W3211 because it is a flagrant assault on the recommendations of the South Suburban Area Plan that advocates keeping the character of these rural neighborhoods intact on this area of Old Salisbury Road. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else who'd like to speak? Seeing none, then I'll declare the public hearing closed. Was the wishes of the board. <coughs> Anyone have any questions of anyone? I do have a question for Mr. Gibby. So you said the rescue squad had this originally, and how did it come to you? Did they donate it to you? No, we. Or you purchased it? 
1959. Winston-Salem Moose Lodge has been in Winston since 1918 on Thurman Street. 1930, they moved to Broad Street. 1959, they bought the land 14 and a half acres on Old Salisbury Road. There was a beach and a creek there. We're, we're surrounded by the, the blue line there, the water that nobody can change. On the other side of that creek we bought, there was four and a half acres. It was a 14 and a half acre track. Sold that four and a half acres off probably in 1980. Uh, Forsyth County Rescue Squad wanted a place to build a building. One of Some of their members were members of the lodge. We donated that land to them as long as they stayed for Scythe County Rescue Squad for one penny a year with an indefinite lease, 99 years, as long as they stayed for Scythe County Rescue Squad. In the 1980s, we also donated a piece of land to a Boy Scout troop, same thing. Back on the back of our property, I don't know how to work this thing, but if you can see, there's a, another building that was built by a Boy Scout troop. This is what our lodge does. We don't want to be at anger with the city or, or the gyro drive. We don't want nobody to be upset. We just want to use what we have. That building, when Boy Scout Troop disbanded, we got that building back. Now we use that for storage, you know. I mean, that's what we're going to use half of this building for, you know. the We've only rented out half of the building. The other half, we store stuff from the lodge in. We've got a 17,000 square foot building there. So we have a lot of people, and you got to have a lot of stuff, okay. you know. So sixteen. But that's so you answered my question. It wasn't yeah. a building you recently purchased. Yeah, came back we, we to didn't purchase we, it. We, we got it, it down. Right, they moved out. They disbanded. And we got the building back. Okay, and so it was something you own outright. Yeah. And rather than leave it empty, you'd prefer to put it to use to generate right. some income to go toward and the biggest that you support. Correct. And the biggest gotcha. tax, not per se tax that we pay on it, is groundwater runoff. You know, that's what I said when we started this thing. You know, if if we can't use the building, it's best to tear the building and plant grass because we don't pay for grass. But we're going to pay for that blacktop. We pay for the building. <clears throat> you know, we've got... 150 square feet, I don't know, Randall would know better than that, of how much impervious ground we have, we pay for. So we're just trying to use it. We, we rent this, we want to rent this space out. 4,000 square feet for $800 a month. That's unheard of in the city of Winston. I own my own business at the same time. I can't rent my office space for less than $1,000 a month. We're just trying to get somebody in this building so that, that, so that it's occupied and it doesn't cost us anything. That's the short of the whole thing. And the staff uh, report was supportive of that, but not particularly these uses. I think they're suggesting maybe some less intense uses that maybe the neighbors could live with, but it seems like we, don't, we haven't found those uses yet. So, But anyway, thank thank, that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, I yeah. do wonder for Ms. Highsmith. I do wonder if there are, yeah, please come forward. I wonder if there are any particular uses that you and the New South Community Coalition would would view as appropriate such that. I think anything that's, anything that's part of residential zoning or institutional zoning would be appropriate for the site. Uh, that would be, um, it can, the building is large enough to be converted into residential housing or or possibly light office, um, but that would be under institutional, so it would have to be rezoned institutional. But we, we do y'all not agree? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think my concern is, you know, we, we put a lot of work into our area plans and we get a lot of community input. And what's hard about this is you're a good organization and your heart's in the right place for what you want to do, but maybe your building isn't in the right place, uh, or at least the uses. So that's what I'm struggling with right now is I, I think if it, right now, when you look at what's with the area plan and the neighborhood, and, um, it, it just doesn't seem very compatible with what's around it. 
Mm -hmm. <coughs> Going further on that, I don't think that the uses are listed or compatible for a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And while the Moose Lodge itself may run that property a certain way, you've already, it, it, if it's sold, the zoning's there, and it might not be mm -hmm. the appropriate, run appropriately by the next person, because once zoning is done, it's done. So, I, yeah, I can't, I can't support this. Out of curiosity, in anticipation of the board's decision to not approve this today, do you have another site that you all have already looked into? Uh, another site to do what with? To move. No, the Winston Salem Moose Lodge doesn't plan on. We're the oldest lodge in the in North Carolina. You know, we're we're not. That's what I told these people when we met with them. You know, we've been in business. <clears throat> we've been on the Chamber of Commerce in Winston Salem since 1918. You know, when they bought that place in 1959, when I started this, I called the city to get advisement on how to go with this. They said in 1960 they had a rezoning meeting, and the only one that showed up was Mr. Brewer. That they showed you his house is right there at Brewer Road, right where the business zoning stops. And, it, and he's owned that house, I guess, since the 1800s. He still lives there. If we would have went, if someone from our organization would have went to that meeting, we could have set it on the side of our property since we already own that property. When it was on, this is just what they told me. I only have one question. I understand, and I know there's a lot of opposition, even from speaking with the planning board. When I started, there was opposition. The plant, Desmond Cooley has done a lot of research in this, and he showed me some stuff that I didn't know. I don't have the book. It's in this book. I don't know what page it's on in this public hearing that he brought up mm -hmm. where it had that little star on our property right there. Mm -hmm. And it says in there that the planning board is okay with the special use that they know it's non-conforming as long as it's used for the same type of automotive use. And that, that's what was printed in this book. Yeah, and I believe we learned that was a mistake, right? Right. Well, <laughs> let, me, let, let me explain. When an area plan is done, we're dealing with literally thousands of acres. Right. And uh, probably 15,000, 20,000 people who live in an area. So it's a rather massive area. So there is not a site-by-site -site investigation mm -hmm. like there is with a zoning case to see if all the uses that happen to be there are legally established uses. And so I think when that area plan was written, it was assumed that that was a legally established use. And so the idea was to certainly, if it were legally nonconforming, it could stay legally. But the plan was very clear about saying that a rezoning to a commercial zoning district was not recommended in the plan. So that remains a fact. The only thing that wasn't done at the time was to investigate the specific uh, uh, legal nonconformity status of this, of this parcel, which really isn't done when area plans are, are being done. Mm -hmm. so. Would NO, NB, or IP give him <coughs> permitted use that would allow this particular occupant to stay in it? No, they, I, I think the issue is they, need, they wanted a rezoning that would allow right. this specific occupant, so you had to go up to this pretty heavy zoning district to allow that. And so one of the things I think the staff has said is that certainly recognizing that there are perhaps other uses that could be in this building that wouldn't require such an intense zoning, uh, that is something that could be explored with the, with the moose law. Are the permitted uses under this zoning request on page 6? They're in that top section there. Manufacturing A and B, motor vehicle repair, those are the permitted uses under the requested zoning that we've narrowed yeah. it down to, to right now, right? Mm -hmm. There are 13 uses there that have been requested. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's on page one and page six. Okay. Yeah, those are the use conditions. So, some of the some of the uses on page one of the report um, may not have use conditions associated with them. So. so there's one other thing. I just want to put one other thing. When I met with the gyro drive, I don't know exactly what they called it. <clears throat> the biggest the thing that they were okay with, and I didn't know how to answer this. Like I said, I've learned as we go. One of the questions they give me is, why can't the city just give you a special use permit to rent that building out 
without rezoning it general business or anything else and they just give you special use so you can keep using that building and you can make an income off of it that's and that they said we'd be okay with y'all using the building we're just not okay with the reason I understand when we started with the ten and a half acres and that's what I told them and it's what I told Desmond I understand that if we rezone it then a couple years from now I leave this job you know it's basically a volunteer job I leave the next guy comes in and says hey we can sell this property to a business we can make ten times the money mm -hmm. I live across the street I don't want to strip them all there either. But that was their question. They said, look, you know, we're okay with you renting it out if they could give you a special use and you can rent it out. And I said, I don't know how that works. Paul, oh, you want to address that? Uh, zoning doesn't work that <coughs> right. way. Right. Sorry. You, you have to have a zoning district that allows that use. You can't, a, a city or a county cannot just single out a use and say, we're going to give you a permit for this but not rezone it. Your heart was in the right place, but we just can't do that. Yeah. Uh, and the concern that there are, I mean, they don't want to set a precedent. You know, they don't want to set a precedent to see GB expand right yeah. there. Right. That's their... yeah. and, and, well, and your rent's reasonable enough that, you know, I know you hate to lose a tenant that's there now, but there, there should be an opportunity to rent it to someone, something that's less intensive use, I would think. Uh, you know, a nursery or a long care or something that would serve the neighborhood. Serve the you know? neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so okay. I'd move that we deny. Yeah. Okay. So second. Motion by Mr. Lamb, second by Ms. Mitchell for denial and discussion. All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, sir. And just for the record, let me let me introduce Desmond Corley on the staff. So we will be the last case, and we'll be presenting this case. Is Gary retired or something, or is he? Uh, we'll get we'll get him going a little bit. Going to the Masters, it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, this is case W thirty two twelve. Excuse me, W thirty two twelve. This one was continued from March 2014. Uh, the petitioner's KRP Investments, LLC. It's about 13 acres at the corner of Noah Drive and Nita Drive, east of University Parkway. Um, they are requesting special use rezoning from RS9 to RM8S. And their requested uses are listed. Um, this is showing you that the site is located in GMA 3, just north and actually adjacent to um, an activity center at Haynes Mill Road. Um, here's our location map. Along the left is University. Um, and as you can see, the shopping center is just under it to the south. This is our aerial showing you it's mostly undeveloped. There are two houses there now that would obviously have to be demolished before um, their proposed apartments went up. Here is our area plan map. This area plan was just adopted Monday um, by City Council. I've outlined the site in green because um, one of the lots is inside of the activity center. This is a photo. Look, we're on Walmart's property looking north at the site. This is um, looking through Walmart's buffer. This is the intersection of Noel Drive and University Parkway looking south. This is Noel Drive um, looking east toward the site. And this is um, one of the proposed access points at the intersection of Noah Drive and Nita Drive. This is 
the house that's on the site right now. And you can see Walmart through the trees, or you can see the lights through the trees. It's right on top of it. This is Nita Drive that goes north from the site. And this is the southernmost lot on Coral Drive. Um, I think this exact spot might be where a proposed access point is. Um, you can see an existing structure. This is an informal pedestrian connection, basically a cut through that people created through Walmart's buffer yard to get to the shopping center. Um, and this is where it goes, right next to their um, <coughs> auto place. I don't know what to call it. Um, this is Coral Drive as it currently is. It's pretty substandard um, and in pretty bad shape. This is looking toward University Parkway, west from the site. Um, here's our site plan. I tried to make it easier for you to tell which street is which. I'm not sure if I <laughs> accomplished that goal, but Noel Drive is the one up here in the top left. I think I have an arrow. Yes, that arrow is pointing to Nita Drive, and then Coral Drive is the one at the bottom. And there are two proposed access points. Um, this circle is highlighting a formalized pedestrian connection to Walmart. I think right now the petitioner is negotiating um, with Walmart to get that access. These are elevations of the proposed apartments. It would be 96 units, all in three-story buildings, I believe. Um, this proposal would increase multifamily, multifamily options near an activity center. Um, previously, when they came with this request, it was an L, and they wanted to go to RM12. Um, we had concerns about traffic and pedestrian access to the activity center. We believe they've addressed those concerns by adding this lot on Coral Drive, um, which I talk about in the next bullet point. The formalized pedestrian connection provides an opportunity to enhance the general walkability of the area. Um, there aren't many sidewalks um, as it is. And we think the request is comparable to the density recommendations of the North Suburban Area Plan. So staff does recommend approval of this request. The site plan meets the requirements of the UDO. And there was a condition added after the book went out that um, sidewalks be installed on Coral Drive along the property line. And if I could just. <clears throat> Uh, see if I could get uh, Desmond to to uh, uh, clarify or confirm this, but as I understand it, the, the petitioner, you saw the picture of the condition of Coral Drive. Right. The petitioner, as part of this, is proposing to uh, pave Coral Drive. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Did the Mac get shrunk? I'm sorry, Lynn. Do you have a question? No, go ahead. <clears throat> the Mac, did this Mac get shrunk? to the south the last time we looked at these maps? Yes, when the recently adopted North Suburban Plan was done, it did shrink some, and that was in recognition that a lot of that larger area up there has no connection back into the activities that are in the activity center. But this particular site straddles the two land uses, the low density residential and the, I think the moderate density mm -hmm. and so given their site plan and given their connections we felt that this is something that we that could have been supported was this in the mac in the last area plan the whole site would have been in the mac in the would have been in the mac. original one. right thank you right. any other questions at this time I, I have one. Yes, just sir. Desmond, can you maybe just quickly kind of go over where the sidewalks again are? You said coral, <clears throat> and then within the complexes, is, yes. is there connectivity? I'm trying to. They do have sidewalks throughout their site. Um, the required sidewalks that that 
that were added as a condition are along the property line on Coral Drive. Right down here. And then they're proposing to build one that connects to Walmart. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Desmond. Okay. This is a public hearing. Uh, signed up uh, as a speaker, Karen Perry. Karen Perry, 7556 Riverside Court, Clemens, North Carolina, 27012. And with me is Sean Brady. Yes, Sean Brady with the Ray Ventures Group. Uh, address is 2964 Peachtree Road, Atlanta, Georgia, 30505. Well, we've got some presentations here to pull up, but I'll just start speaking. Um, I am a resident of Forsyth County. Um, and the proposed uh, multifamily property, Abington Gardens of Winston-Salem, um, um, is, is 96 units, which we'll discuss in greater detail further. But a little bit of, how do you, <laughs> a little bit of my background, just an experience, is um, been in public accounting and working with um, housing and management and. Uh, for 20-something years and for the last 11 plus years in, in development and in all facets of that with structuring and financing. Um, uh, completed projects have been seven since 2010 and my partnership with Ray Ventures has been the last two and a half or so years and we are actually building a property in Southport, North Carolina right now. So I'll give you a, um, turn it over to Sean to talk a little bit about their experience. Um, Okay, thank you, Karen. Just a little bit of uh, background. I'm going to go over the design very quickly and kind of the evolving process as we work with the with the city staff and the community. Ray Ventures Group, though, uh, we're also we're co-partners, we're co-owners and guarantors on the project, so we're here for the duration, not just build it and move on to the next the next place. Um, we've built 3,400 units uh, all over the country. We have uh, locations shown there, including uh, our most uh, recent here in North Carolina in Southport, uh, Abington Oaks with KRP Investments. The project location, uh, this is just aerial photo off of Google Earth to show uh, we're basically um, just north of the Walmart shopping center there. The concept is for 96 units, uh, as Desmond mentioned, uh, multifamily housing, uh, two, three, and four bedroom units. Um, it'll be professionally managed by Jim Management, uh, which manages a lot of units here in North Carolina and have a, a host wealth of unit and site amenities as well as supportive services um, at no additional charge for the residents. Uh, the design process, we've definitely evolved from what our first concept was. Uh, we held a neighborhood meeting on March the 4th, and we had 14 people uh, in attendance there. Uh, I think the neighborhood turned out uh, pretty well for that. Uh, some of the concerns that came up, concerns over traffic uh, from the single entrance that we had on Noel Anita Drive. Uh, also, there are some concerns about proximity and visibility from some of the homes on Noel Anita, uh, as well as just concerns about long-term upkeep of the property. Um, staff also uh, kind of had, there's a lot of overlap there on uh, the ingress and egress for the, for the traffic control, uh, pedestrian connectivity, and then density as well. Um, and so basically, we took all those comments to heart. Um, we added uh, additional property, redesigned the project. That's why we asked for the continuance, was to provide us the opportunity uh, to try to make everything right. Um, and uh, so some of the things here have got them itemized. We did, uh, we moved our, our northernmost building basically as far to the south as we could get it to go um, to uh, basically address the concerns about visibility from the existing residents on Noel and Nita Drive. Um, we did create that second entrance on Foral Drive, so we would be dispersing the traffic in two directions now, not just onto Noel and Nita Drive. Um, we also did add the pedestrian connection to Walmart. Uh, and we have, by the way, we are in discussions, we have a verbal agreement with the owners of the shopping center uh, to basically build the stairs down for, uh, so basically formalize what's already uh, informal there with the pedestrian connectivity. Um, and, uh, you know, we've also in, in the process and adding the additional property been able to uh, both lower the density of the development as well as provide a, basically greatly increase our buffer areas as well. Previously, we just had a buffer on the east side where the, uh, the creek is there. Now we also have buffers on the north. Uh, and on the west as, as well. So we've basically buffered ourselves with um, as much as we can possibly do to minimize our visibility and our impact on the community. 
Um, and I do know that traffic is one of the concerns, and I believe that that's also that has been addressed in the in terms of just the, the traffic count because University Parkway it's a busy road, and it's a busy road because there's a lot of activity centers there. That's why we're also interested in putting the residents there where the services are nearby. Um, but I believe in the in the uh, the, uh, the staff's report, I, basically the difference is negligible um, in the traffic calculations versus single family residential versus what we're proposing. I think it came out to about. Uh, just under 603 trips per day if it was just single family residential as it is versus our proposed use at 638 trips per day. So more, more or less largely, largely negligible. Um, this is a rendering of the project site. This one's just in color. Same rendering that, you, that was in our submittal. Uh, this is the site plan. Same as this is actually the stormwater control uh, plan there just to kind of show how it, uh, how it is laid out. Uh, this is just to give an idea of what the two, three, and four bedroom units uh, will look like. I mean, they'll be, you know, spacious, uh, you know, nice units with a lot of amenities in them. Uh, this is an example of one of our finished projects. This is just north of Savannah, Georgia. Um, this, uh, uh, this one is a 60-unit development um, and is comparable uh, in terms of design, appearance, quality is, is what we would propose to, to build here. Uh, this is a listing of the unit amenities, uh, Energy Star appliances. I mean, they'll, they'll be very nice furnished apartments. And uh, this is an example of the site amenities. We'll have a freestanding community building, computer center, picnic area, um, on-site laundry, uh, playground, and uh, exercise uh, and fitness center as well. Um, so that's kind of the overview of the process, kind of how we got to where we're at. Um, uh, appreciate the opportunity, all the input that we've had as well. And, uh, you know, we... Um, we've done everything that, uh, that we think that we can do within our power to, to try to, to be a good neighbor and fit into the community. I'd like to turn it over just a couple more minutes for Karen, though, to hit on the, the long-term upkeep of the property after I've talked about the design, because that's, you know, that's, that's also very important. Karen? Yeah, one of the things that, um, <clears throat> just as a, as a standpoint and, and as a passion for what we do and what I do, is we really look and see ourselves as a good neighbor and as part of community. Um, and that's we we've been working with um, with Councilwoman Vivian Burke early on before we ever got you know just just got this far along the process and we've really taken to heart what the residents said <coughs> and what the neighbors were concerned about and try to address all those as well as staff. Um, so we see ourselves as that long-term partner in the community that builds enhancement. Um, part of our supportive services is um, just social events. Um, they're the last item is a resident newsletter. We do recognize birthdays and try to build a community in and of ourselves within the complex. Um, we do a lot of times reach out to financial institutions. There's banks in the area where we may have budgeting classes on our property. Um, we, same with health and nutrition and then the fitness area we that we have will may do some exercise classes and we work with residents to help them do that for themselves um, one of the great conversations that we actually had and I do have a letter um, supporting from lollipop stop which is on Noel Drive and it's a um, child development center um, Melissa Womack is here and has provided a letter of, of support that we would like to um, she brought it here this evening um, and would like to provide you. So she and I were talking about maybe some child and par child care and parenting classes that we could work to, to help our, our residents as well longer term. Um, this is just an example of a typical employment of folks um, that live in workforce housing. As you will notice, 20, um, a large, off, you know, large number in retail and the second in restaurant. So a lot of the services that are in this community that we, we would hope and our vision would be that those folks can live and work closer to where they, or live closer to where they work. Um, Gym management is actually out of Charlotte, North Carolina. They've been in this business for a long time and have done great. The bulk, almost 50% of their units they manage are in North Carolina. Um, so they, they have site man they, we will hire site manager and maintenance staff locally and then they will have regional oversight. Um, be, be, be professionally landscaped. We actually walk our properties to make sure that they the curb appeal stays nice um, as well as the resident uh, screening criminal background checks, income checks as well as rental references, uh, the ability to pay on time. Um, so we really try to um, 
enhance the community, enhance our property, and to make sure that it's very well managed. And of course, if, p if people care about where they live, they take care of it and it helps us longer term as well. Um, the process itself, we submitted a preliminary application January 24th. The site scores came out in March just a few weeks ago, and we did receive a perfect site score from North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. We are working now, as you know, through the rezoning process. The main thing is our full application is due at noon on May 16th, so we're kind of under a, t a time frame here that is, um, you know, out of our control. <laughs> it's just is it's what it is. So we are we are moving and trying to work towards making sure we stay on task. The awards actually come out in August and from there we will um, we've already made been are making preliminary um, equity and lender and investor um, we've got a lot of folks interested in it um, and investing and being partners here in Winston Salem as well. Um, and, and lending, so we're, we're kind of preliminary lining all that up, but if with the ward in hand, we would see that construction would start hopefully in January 2015, and it would be ready to start moving people in about Jan December 2015 or January. So um, we're excited to uh, really enhance what's happening over there and to add some really great opportunities for housing for the folks that, and, and the, the other thing is we really hope that it spurs some of that economic development that is, was visioned to happen further beyond Haynes Mill Road down University as well, um, and, and even on Haynes Mill. So hopefully that this will be a, a thing that helps, a catalyst that helps it continue to what the vision I think was a few years ago before, <laughs> before our tough times. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. How much time we have left? About a minute and a half. Minute and a half. Uh, Michael Gray. I'm pass. Okay. Tom King. You can pass. Anyone else like to speak in support? Yeah. Okay. Then we'll turn to the opposition. Uh, one person signed up is uh, Robin Booker. Good evening, sir. My name is Lloyd Booker, and Robin is my wife. I've resided at 541 Needle Drive for, since 1978, and our concerns are my wife has a lung condition, very serious lung condition. Uh, when this project takes place, if it's approved, we wonder how it's going to affect her. Also, how is it going to inconvenience us? We're the ones that's 500 yards from the property. And we just had questions. Uh, I have to question when they said that the neighborhood turnout was great. Clayton Acres is a large area. And the people that were there were people who were owner of the land. So I didn't see a lot of input from the neighbors in the neighborhood. So I don't know if they were notified. Well, that's the question I asked during the meeting. So uh, again, those would be our questions, uh, whether or not the city is going to require them to build another road there. Uh, because we're right there at Noel in need of my driveway sits right there. Is that going to be a convenience to us? Are we going to be able to access our driveway without any problems? So those are the questions we have uh, about this whole thing, whether or not they would erect a privacy fence to just block us from what they're going to be erecting. So uh, again, those are questions we have about this whole project. Okay. Thank you. No one else has signed up. Does anyone else like to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'll declare the public hearing closed. Um, uh, I wonder, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, <clears throat> Aaron, could you pull up the proper, uh, yeah. property map and see if you can point out exactly, maybe with the gentleman's ha uh, help, where the property is in relation to... <clears throat> where your house is located at? <coughs> Here's uh, Noel and Nita right there. And the way Noel and Nita works, when you come into Noel, they connect. They're not two separate roads. They, it's a curve, and, and it changes to yeah. Nita Drive. I'm, if you're coming off of San Diego, That's not right. The one with the arrows? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right there. Right there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and with that in mind, could you pull up the uh, site plan and explain how the road is going all the way down from that point all the way down to Coral Drive? There. Yeah. So the, the, um, the gentleman that was just up here, his house is located just 
um, outside of the, the site plan area. If you can kind of see where the mouse is hovering, that's where his house is located. Um, Noel Drive comes in uh, east-west at this point. Nita comes in north-south at this point, and they intersect right here. Um, what's proposed is the uh, apartment developers would basically come due south off of Nita, if you can kind of follow the mouse there, um, back through the site, and then it would connect um, down to Coral Drive. Um, the property line that's shared with the gentleman that was just up here, um, you can see this sort of uh, bubble clouding here that's indicating the existing vegetation that's currently on the site would remain. So it, it doesn't look like there's a fence proposed right there, but it does look like existing vegetation is trying to be remain, trying to be retained to provide some kind of screening. And what's the approximate distance to that first building there? I can't tell from this scale from here, but <laughs> it's got to be... Can you, can you measure on the site plan there what... Uh, Luke, can you explain? Yeah. Probably about 150, 125 to 150 feet from Mr. Booker's property line to the first building. That's correct. Luke Dickey with Stimmel Associates. We helped with the site plan. Uh, 601 North Trade Street to uh, uh, 601 North Trade Street, 27101 here in Winston. Uh, basically, yeah, we're 75 feet basically to where the Luell Drive uh, right away starts, and then you got another 60 feet to the property line, so it's a total of 135 feet from the north side of that building to basically Mr. Booker's property. Plus, from distance then on the other side of the street, on the well as well, to his house. And then to yeah. his house, yeah, we don't know what the distance is there, so it, it's going to be more than 135 feet to probably 150 feet, like Chris had mentioned. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Luke. And, I mean, you don't know the traffic, I would think. You're going to use Coral more than you are Noel. And, I mean, you don't know that. But Well, and that's the advantage of having more than one access yeah. point for right. a development is that you're able to disperse the traffic. Had this connection to Coral not been made, yeah. then all of the traffic would have would have accessed this site through Noel and, and Nita yeah. right there. So basically by having more than one connection, there are lots of options, and it helps to disperse the traffic. Right. Mm -hmm. right. uh -huh. That's exactly where we say we want to put, yeah. you know, moderate and high-density housing. Fits with it. Okay. It's going to, you know, yep. be going for Very much. Questions? Or? Oh, the public hearing has been closed, oh. so we're, yeah. Yeah. we're in just, work session and waiting for a motion or comment. Just a couple of comments. I, the traffic impact study with existing zoning, zoning is, what, 602 trips a day with the change to be 638. So the traffic should not be much different than if that was zoned single family. What I really like about it, I agree, I like when you have an activity center, I'm a big walker, is I like to see that people can walk places in the connectivity, and I like this density close to an activity center. So there's a lot of things I really like about it. So, with that being said, I move approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Mitchell, second by Mr. Lamb, and discussion. Uh, one, uh, one, you did say sidewalks on coral. I don't think that was part of that. That's an additional condition, right? <laughs> and this paving of coral drive, uh, that I didn't see that in the report. Now, they've agreed to do that as a condition as well. Is that what I heard you say, Paul? I, I think I'm seeing the petitioner agree, so probably would be good to kind of word that as, as volunteered by the petitioner. Yeah, we, we've got the condition in here. Um, other requirements, this is for the driveway permit. Uh, other requirements include, but are not limited to, dedication of public right-of-way 20 feet from the center of Coral Drive um, through the frontage of the pin number 6829314406 and widening of Coral Drive 11 feet from its center um, from the proposed access drive back to University Parkway. And then I think Desmond added in the sidewalk provision during his presentation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. All this Okay. Any other questions, comments? We have a motion for approval. All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Dickey, you might want to speak to Mr. Booker before he leaves and just to go review the site plan with him, if you would. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is on docket W3216, very similar to the previous request, a multifamily development uh, with adjacent single-family 
um, connection issues. Um, petitioner is Betty Gentry, Carol Wood, and Margie Turner. Um, the site is 8.19 acres, uh, located on the northeast side of Renola Road, northwest of Winona Street. Uh, and the request is for a special use rezoning from RS9 residential single family, and there's a very small bit of HB Highway business zoning on the property uh, to RM8S, residential multifamily, where the maximum density is eight units per acre. Uh, this is Legacy's growth management plan. You can see it's located here in the northwest portion of the city of Winston-Salem in the yellow uh, suburban neighborhoods growth management area three. Uh, just northwest of an activity center there at the intersection of uh, Renolda Road and uh, Yadkinville. And Renolda Road is a major thoroughfare. Uh, this is Renolda Road here. Uh, you see the subject property shown here in yellow. Um, it's primarily <coughs> undeveloped. Uh, there is one single family home on there that would be removed if the uh, project is approved to make way for the proposed improvements. Um, and this site really serves as a good transitional area between the high intensity commercial uses along Renolda Road that are zoned highway business. Uh, you have the Old Town Shopping Center uh, located here, uh, some more highway business zoning on both sides of Renolda. A little bit of multifamily zoning here, Providence Point multifamily uh, just beyond the site. And then again, in between the commercial on Renolda and then the single family zoning here in Cheshire Woods and along uh, Hartford Road here uh, is an R RS9 and RM12, RS12, excuse me. Uh, aerial photograph taken in 2010 of the subject property. Uh, again, it's primarily undeveloped, uh, fairly heavily wooded. Um, and there are two small streams that run along the perimeter uh, of the site. So this also shows the zoning designations and uh, lotting patterns, development patterns uh, in the area. Uh, this is the very recently adopted North Suburban Area Plan adopted by City Council. Uh, this is in the update uh, Monday night. Um, just a quick breakdown of the color uh, colors uh, of the site. You see red. Obviously, that recommends uh, or, or identifies commercial. Uh, you have some commercial and office limited uh, limited office uses here along in the stripe pattern. Uh, and the yellow is uh, low density residential, up to eight units per acre, but detached single family residential. And in the various shades of brown, recommend multifamily residential, with the darker brown uh, being high density residential above 18 units per acre, uh, the medium brown being intermediate density residential between eight and 18 units per acre, and then the subject property shown here in the light tan. Uh, that's recommended for up to eight units per acre, but attached uh, residential. So really the, the recommended density for this subject property is the same as what you see in the yellow, but it, is, it does allow for attached units, so basically for, for clustering on the site. So the request is consistent with a recently adopted plan in regard to that density of residential. Uh, these images are taken on site here. This is looking northwest along Renolda Road, which again is a major thoroughfare. Um, uh, this is at the intersection there of Winona Street. Uh, Renolda Road is served by Route 19 transit route, which again is a good location typically for multifamily, having direct access to transit, uh, sidewalks along Renolda, and the shopping center in the background there. Uh, this is looking north on Hartford Street, uh, there at the intersection of Maverick. Uh, most of the homes along Hartford were built in the 60s. Um, and here in the Cheshire Woods neighborhood. This is looking north on Cheshire Woods Drive uh, at the intersection of Cheshire, Cheshire Place Court. Um, this actually eventually connects to uh, Morningside and then Chatillon if you continue northward, standing in the same position now looking south towards the subject property in the background there where the woods are located. Uh, this is also on Cheshire Woods uh, Drive. Stepping in a little bit closer to the site, um, this is a subject property here in the background, uh, and the street does stub into the property. Obviously, it was stubbed for the purposes of continuing development. Uh, there was not a permanent uh, cul-de-sac placed here with a large radius to turn around a truck in, similar to a, another neighboring street. This was terminated for the point, uh, for the purpose of continuing into the subject property to facilitate development. Uh, this is the site plan showing the subject property here. Have on the left uh, Renolda Road, 
uh, where the primary entrance would be right across from Pratt Road. Uh, so that would be the name if this is approved, continue to, to Pratt Road here. Secondary entrance here at Cheshire Woods Drive. Uh, that would be the continued name, Cheshire Woods Drive, to this intersection, and then it would change to Pratt Road. Uh, basically what we have are four uh, multifamily buildings from 14 to 16 units in each building. Really not very big buildings from a multifamily standpoint. These are all two-story. They're not three, four, and five-story units. Uh, fairly um, modest scale from a multifamily development standpoint. Uh, it also uh, includes about a 1,900 square foot office located here with some recreational area, about 9,000 square foot recreational area there near the entrance to Renolda uh, for the residents of the development. Uh, from a stormwater standpoint, it does include a uh, stormwater management facility that would accommodate stormwater quality and quantity, uh, and the site really has significantly less amount of impervious coverage that is allowed in the RS, uh, RM9 district, which is 70%. They're going at about 36%. Um, also, around the entire site, they are proposing a 30-foot um, Type 2 buffer yard. And what that consists of is per 100 feet, per 100 linear feet, that's two deciduous trees and eight primary evergreen plants. And those are your, your hollies or your red cedars that uh, are, have to be eight feet tall, excuse me, six, six feet tall at planting, but can get at least 10 feet tall. So eight of those and two deciduous trees per 100 feet. Uh, but in addition to that, um, what I've shown here in green, these are tree save areas. So these, this is part of the existing heavily wooded portion of the site that will be retained. So all these areas would be flagged in the field prior to the issuance of a grading permit uh, for preservation. So we, we really like to see that when we can, uh, as opposed to completely grading the site, which is sometimes the only alternative in going back with new small, smaller plantings. So these mature plantings would be uh, preserved. And then in addition to what you have on your site plan, uh, the developer has recently just agreed to, in this area here, you see the darker green provide about 31 uh, Burford Hollies. Uh, those would be in five-gallon containers, probably around six feet also uh, at planting uh, there along, along the, uh, this, this road here. So really from, from the Cheshire Woods neighborhood, uh, looking south into the site, you're going to see the building, but you're also going to see a lot of the existing vegetation and some new screening uh, to really soften the view looking into that, that two-story building. Uh, from a pedestrian circulation standpoint, uh, very good. They have sidewalks around all of the buildings, uh, two lateral sidewalk connections onto the existing sidewalk at, um, at Renolda Road. And they will also, there's a condition that they work with WISTA in regard to a potential transit stop. Uh, also showing a sidewalk uh, that would extend up to the property line at Cheshire Woods Drive. Um, from a traffic standpoint, really, um, uh, these are the elevations, again, uh, primarily brick and, and just uh, two stories. Uh, from a traffic analysis standpoint, um, not, a, a TIS was not triggered and was not required, but we really see this similar to the previous request you just heard on a Noel Drive comparable to the existing development. Um, under the current single-family RS9 zoning, you can expect a potential maximum of 39 homes uh, for about 373 vehicles per day. Uh, under the proposal with 62 apartment units, uh, again coming in at under 8 units per acre, we anticipate about a 412 um, vehicle trip. So it's, 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 it's a little bit more, but essentially comparable. Apartment <coughs> units... The reason that is is they generate less trips per day than a detached single-family home. And, and to leave your house in the morning and come back in the evening, that's two trips. Consider two trips. Um, <clears throat> the request is consistent with the recommendations of Legacy, and which recommends is office and moderate density residential as a good transitional use, again, between single-family residential and higher-intensity commercial uses. And again, it's uh, consistent with the update, updated uh, North Suburban Area Plan update. Uh, which recommends um, attached units up to eight units per acre. Um, and again, as I noted, the traffic increase is comparable with single-family development. Uh, it will improve interconnectivity in the area and will enhance public safety and service delivery. And, and uh, it, it, if the discussion warrants, I have some more images in regard to street connectivity. Uh, it is an ordinance requirement uh, that this street be extended into Cheshire Woods Drive. 
Um, it also serves as a transitional area, as I mentioned, between the adjacent single family homes and commercial uses. And it would provide a greater mixture of uses along Renolda Road, which is served by transit. So the staff's recommendation is for approval. And the site plan does meet UDA requirements. And we do have a slightly revised condition uh, under prior to signing the final plat. You see this portion that I've underlined there. That's, that's a, a new condition that would just uh, states, including the public act, that they have to record a plat. <coughs> showing the public access and utility easements, including the public access easement, which connects Renolda Drive to Cheshire Woods Drive. Um, I, I failed to mention earlier when I was going over the site plan, um, the ordinance does require a continuation of public streets when they stub into properties uh, such as this. Obviously, they want to do um, head-end parking, 90-degree parking, which is not allowed on public streets. So we came to a compromise to where the connection would still be made but it would be a public access easement, so the public would have the right to, to traverse through uh, the area. And we see really that, that head-end parking as being a good traffic calming element to, to discourage high-speed cut-through because you're going to have to deal with a, basically driving through a parking lot in that T intersection when Cheshire Woods and Pratt Drive intersect and then maybe a, a potential another cut traffic calming element where they connect the public street and the private street. Um, but I'll be glad to answer any questions. Staff's recommendation is for approval. Thank you, Gary. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Can you repeat what you said maybe on the previous slide about the required continuation of streets where, where they're stubbed like Cheshire is? Yes, yes. The UDA requires that public streets be extended where they, where they stub to a property line and there's new development that takes place at the other end of that property. That's, a, that's an ordinance requirement. Okay, thank you. And, and now, there are a couple of exceptions, as Aaron mentioned, where, where there's a topography or an unusual lotting pattern uh, or a stream, something of that nature, which really this is just about at grade. It's, it's a, it's a, there's no um, constraints physically to prohibit this connection. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions of staff at this time? Okay, this is a public hearing. Uh, first person to speak, signed up is David Reese. Mm. I'm the CESI uh, the engineering company that drew the plan. Uh, and I'm going to let Tracy Dusenberry, who's second on that list, speak. She's with the developer. Okay. Thank you. Hi. I'm Tracy Dusenberry. My address, my current address is 2306 West Main Street, Richmond, Virginia. But I just want to point out I am from North Carolina and lived here all of my life except for the past few years. So <laughs> I wanted to point that out. Um, I think Gary did a great job explaining our proposal. He touched on about everything I think I could talk about. The only thing I really want to add is that we have experience developing communities like this all over the Carolinas and Virginia. We have one right here in Winston-Salem that's been very successful called Orchard Creek off of West Clemensville Road. It opened the doors in 2011. Uh, we've been very proud of that property, and um, that was right beside of a single-family neighborhood who, of course, had concerns because everyone does when you're developing. But since we developed it, um, met with the neighbors, and um, we've had no complaints. Um, I've spoken with Representative Light and the City Housing Department. They've had no complaints. As a matter of fact, they even invited us to come back, and we develop, we're in the process of developing another development on um, Peters Creek Parkway called Rockwood, and that should start construction very soon. But, um, you know, proper maintenance and management, those, those are very, very important to us. Getting the right people in our communities and doing a good job, being good neighbors, that's very important. And that's one of the reasons we're asked to come back to communities, and that's why I'm here before you tonight, because um, this property of on Ronaldo, we thought that this would be a good area. It's a different market area from the um, other ward where we've been developing. Um, we met with several of the neighbors a few nights ago, and we had a very good turnout. I'm so glad everyone came out to give us their feedback and opinion. We, we love to incorporate the neighbors' um, um, opinion into our design if we can. One of the main concerns I heard at that meeting was um, well, I, first of all, I received several calls from people who live along um, Hertford and um, <coughs> Winona who were in support of what we're doing. 
but the, most of the residents who came to the meeting, we probably had about 30 people there, were concerned about the road that we're having to put in at the rear of our property to connect with Cheshire Woods Drive. When we originally submitted our plan, um, we weren't required to have two ingress egresses because of the amount of units we had. But um, staff did ask us to include this because the UDO does require interconnectivity. So we added that road that connects with Cheshire Woods Drive. So that was one of the main concerns we heard at the meeting. Some of the other concerns were just about buffering and, um, um, and traffic you know, flow. So some of the things that we've done after listening to the residents' concern is we've gone back and actually increased the buffer that we were required to put in. And as Gary mentioned, we're adding an additional 31 evergreen trees, um, Buford Hollies. We're going to plant them at at least six feet so that they're already there um, and um, covering as a buffer immediately from the time we develop. The other thing we're doing is we're adding some signs, um, 20 mile per hour speed limit signs, in our road, we're going to put a guardrail in at the end of the road, and we're going to put a left turn ahead sign because there will be a 90 degree turn going down that connection road. So those are the things that we've been able to do to, um, to um, address some of the residents' concerns. I think um, what's important to know is that this development is consistent, like Gary said, with the legacy plan. We think it's a great site because it is a tr transitional site between commercial and single family. I think the um, legacy plan calls for that. And also the North Suburban plan calls for um, multifamily in this area and some commercial at eight units an acre. And we're doing less than that. We're doing 62 units. Um, the other developer who, who was here was talking about a lot of the programs that they put in place at their properties. And I just want to take a moment to mention at Orchard Creek, which is on West Clemensville Road, we've won a statewide award there for the programs that we do with our residents. Um, we have actually um, gotten continuing education money for 16 of the residents, several of whom were um, high school students who needed money for college. We put in a big computer lab so that the students can actually do their homework on site. And we started a program for the youth there so that they will take pride in their community where they win awards for doing things around the community and taking pride in where they live. So those are a few of the things that we do and that we hope to do at this new development also. And as David said, he's here. And if you have any specific or technical questions about the road or um, distances, we'll feel free to answer any of those questions. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak in support of this? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Come forward and give us your name, address, and zip code for the record, <clears throat> please, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Anderson, 1631 uh, Yadkin Valley Road in Advance, North Carolina, 27006. Um, I'm here to speak in uh, uh, favor of the project. Uh, uh, Freeman Commercial represents uh, the Gentry family, the, the Wood and Turners uh, of, the, of the subject property. And we've had the property, Freeman has had the property on the market uh, for sale for probably uh, over three years. The, the Gentry's property was on the market five years ago with us and they took it off the market because of the economic times. But um, the, these families are both, um, the, their property is, is uh, generations of property. The families have owned it for two and three generations. Uh, this is very important to them. So I just wanted to speak on their behalf. They were, they're not here, um, that their property is on the market. We look for, our firm looks for targeting the highest and best use type of, of users for sellers. And... Um, Frankly, we uh, have had relationships and, and worked with Halkin Development in the past, so we shared this property with them because of the, the UDO uh, requirements and that felt like this was a good um, project for this property. So um, just speaking on the behalf of the, uh, of the owners of the property. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to speak in support of this? 
Seeing none, then we'll turn to the opposition. Elizabeth Saba Rabiati. Is that close, sir? That's correct, actually. All but right. Renee is going to speak first, if that's okay. Uh, sure. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our concerns. My name is Renee Baker. I live at 3664 Cheshire Woods Drive, Winston-Salem 27106. I am here speaking on behalf of the Cheshire and Morningside community. And we have a few issues that substantiate our opposition to this pro project. Um, one of the issues is overpopulation and density. Uh, the developers have stated that they manage high quality apartment complexes, and their goal is to improve upon neighborhoods by providing affordable housing options. However, this goal is not evident in their proposal to place 62 families on a property that cannot accommodate the social needs of that community nor the existing community. There are no parks, public pools, walking, or bicycle tra trails in this community, and we know that overcrowding does lead to higher incidences of crime waste and noise pollution, as well as traffic issues. So given the developer's obvious need for profit uh, over quality of life, our community has no choice but to petition against this proposal. One other concern that we have uh, is in respect to the UDO and legacy requirements for connectivity. As if the attempt to overcrowd the community at large is not counterproductive enough, this plan would require the developer to open access to Cheshire Woods Drive a dead-end street that is already too small for the existing single-family homeowners. This narrow street can barely accommodate the vehicles of current residents. While connectivity is an understandable goal of the UDO, I feel like deliberate consideration must be given to this case because it poses a direct threat to the safety of the residential children who access this road because their front yards are not set back very far from the street. It poses threats to the visually impaired and wheelchair-bound residents who fear a huge increase in oncoming traffic entering and, ex and exiting the apartment complex. And it also poses the threat of increased noise pollution from cars driving through the streets and blasting stereo systems at various times of the day and night. Again, this is a direct threat to our quality of life. And lastly, I feel that, and I think I speak for all of the uh, residents of Cheshire Woods and Morningside, we feel that this proposal is a direct contradiction to the Winston-Salem's uh, encouragement of home ownership. In the early 2000s, the city of Winston-Salem encouraged single-family home ownership as an investment for the city as well as the individual cities, citizens. Excuse me. Many of us took the bait feeling proud to contribute as taxpayers and begin our own investments in the American dream. Ten years later, as we have added to the tax revenue stream, our city representatives try to convince us that adding huge apartment develops less than or approximately 100 feet from our homes without vast sprawling green buffers, and again, I don't mean the small buffers that are required by the city, but the use of vast separations of land. Without the use of these bu buffers, it's somehow good for our diversification, quality of life, and property values. Our community not only disagrees with this logic, but we resent the insult to our intelligence that part of, on the part of the developers and the city representatives who support this plan. Unfortunately, we cannot consider supporting this plan unless the development decreases density to a maximum of 40 units and most importantly, that an exception be made to the ordinance for connectivity. There are other compromises to be discussed, but these issues are our top priority. And uh, we would have no choice but to petition, and we already have started that process, to petition, pick it if necessary, and bring more attention to the city's plans for not only our neighborhood, but the greater North Ward community, as urban sprawl creates an influx of people and overcrowding of existing small neighborhoods. And we ask that you please consider our concerns very seriously. Again, I just want to reiterate that while we understand the need for development, we understand the city's overall plan for, you know, 10 years forward, I do think that the city of Winston-Salem should truly consider these plans for uh, so-called development. I mean, many people come here 
from various parts of the country because Winston-Salem is a great place to live. So it's, it's definitely understandable that we need to uh, build housing to accommodate that. But what I think the city of Winston-Salem definitely doesn't want to do is replicate some of the inner city problems that are created by compounding and compacting so many people in small areas of land without resources, without walking areas or, or running in recreational areas beyond what's on the site. There's a, a larger community at risk here. And again, I just really hope that you will consider our concerns very seriously and not pass this proposal as it stands. We definitely are open to talking about other plans or compromises with the developers. However, we do not support it as it stands. And thank you again for your time. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. My, na <clears throat> Sorry. My name is Elizabeth Sabarabiati. I live at 3639 Cheshire Woods Drive, Winston-Salem, 27106. Um, my property is adjacent to the new property. Um, when I moved here from Massachusetts to raise my family 10 years ago, I knew it was a residential area. I knew the property next to me was not being sold at the time, but that it was zoned RS9 and that there was a possibility that additional 30-some houses could be built there. I also knew that about the property that's on Ronaldo Road that is now Providence Point. So we've already been through this once where property that should have been zoned RS9 was changed on us. So now we're being asked again to accept it being changed. Um, I'm not happy about the plan of the apartments. I'm especially not happy of 30 of 62 units. Um, I know they say it's less than the 64 they could put there, but it is still too much traffic for our street. Um, I cannot I am in fear for my five children. I'm in fear for my mother who lives across the street to me, from me. I moved her there because it was a safe neighborhood for her to be in. She is in a wheelchair and she is hearing, impa hearing impaired. So she would not hear the traffic coming down the street. The neighbors you know, know of her. They see her going to the bus stop to get one of her grandchildren. They see her coming back and forth to visit her grandchildren in my house. Um, I'm scared about what could happen for her and for my children. Um, we do not have driveways or yards that are very big. Most people can only fit one car in their driveway, so then they have to park their other car on the street. Um, I know that 400 trips per day does not seem like a lot. I know a lot of those will go out to Ronaldo Road, but also a lot of those will come down our street. Right now, there are 14 houses in that, on that block. So if you figure out the trips that we have per day now and then compound it to adding 62 more units to that area. Um, my biggest concern about the road is even though it's through the apartment building, it will cut out the corner of Chatelon Drive and Ronaldo Road in front of Old Town Elementary School where there's a traffic light. And it will be the only direct route from Ronaldo Road to Chatelon that does not involve turning multiple times throughout Hartford and the other neighborhoods. Um, I know I would cut through it if I needed to get out. I know that when I need to go to Yakinville Road or to University or to 52, I drive down Cheshire Woods Drive through Squire, down Squire, to Chatelon. And those 62 people who will be living <coughs> next to me will also be driving down Cheshire Place Drive to get to other areas in the neighborhood, or to other areas in the city, I'm sorry. Um, your plans do not make our road safer. It may make it more convenient for emergency vehicles, but it will not make it safer for them to get to us. We've had the ambulance down the street many times for my mother. The fire truck comes down to work on the hydrants. Yes, it would be more convenient, but it would not make it safer for us. Um, I ask that um, those of you that are considering this, that you come and visit our neighborhood. Unfortunately, the picture we saw must have been taken during the day when people were at work because you don't see the kids outside riding their bikes because there's no sidewalks. You don't see the um, toddlers down the street that are playing out in their neighborhood. You don't see the trans aid that is coming to pick up our neighbors that are handicapped. Um, you, don't, you don't see that. You don't see people out there walking. People walk the neighborhood on the street for exercise. Those are the things that you all miss. So I'd love for you to come visit us you know, in the evening one day. Um, this proposal will take an area that should be used for single family homes. And that area would, um, I, I understand that everyone needs a place to live. I understand that. I understand that people rent and that all of us have rented at some place. But this is not good planning for our area and for our neighborhood. The impact of the more than 400 trips in and around our neighborhood is not acceptable to us. Um, it, would it be to any of you? 
Would you want 400 more trips in and out of your neighborhood? Please do not try to fool yourselves into getting us to believe that Ronaldo Road will be the way people will drive. We're, we're not stupid. We know that that is not the case. We will be bringing not only traffic onto our neighborhood, we will be bringing the possibility of crime, of more people living in the area, of noise. Um, I understand the apartment complex screens their residents, but they cannot screen anyone that will drive off of Ronaldo Road. They cannot screen the visitors that will be visiting those apartments. I am sure that they will be nice. I'm sure they will be of quality for the people who live there, but it will ruin our quality of life. And what will those apartments look like in 10 or 20 years? Because like my neighbors, we bought our homes to live there long term. This is so disturbing to me that I feel like living and working in Winston-Salem was not a wise choice for me. It was not wise for me to move here. It was not wise to move my mother down from the north to be here. I, it's to the point that I feel like I would be better off if I was living in another state or another city. I feel that um, our opinion and our quality of life has been disregarded by the developers and by city planning. I do not understand how public policy does not take into effect the public that is going to be impacted the most. Um, we know that this project would never have happened if we lived in the Buena Vista area or if we lived in another high rent, high tax area. I cho chose to live in a diverse neighborhood. I chose to live in a neighborhood and an area that my children would have experiences that they wouldn't have had if I chose somewhere else. I chose to live somewhere where I would not be house poor, but I'd be able to make my payments and pay my bills and pay my taxes. The mission of the planning board, I just read it over here, says that it is um, responsible stewardship of the natural environment. I understand the development's going to happen and that these woods are for sale and they can be developed. There are animals that live there, um, and where do they go? And it is also another part of your mission statement is to provide beautiful, livable, harmonious, economically successful communities. That is what our community will be losing if this proposal goes through. I oppose this, as I think anyone else would. Um, opening my neighborhood up to 62 more families um, in an entire city that can drive through, um, that is not an acceptable choice for us. Thank you for hearing me out. Can I have Thank a question? You. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Just one question out of curiosity once again for the residents of the community who are present. How many of you have school-aged children that are Hi. in that community and that are present today? That are present here today? Yes. Mine are not present today. Just a show of hands. The people that are present. Just a show of hands. The people that are present. School-aged children. Kids are here? No, no, no. Oh, the people oh, who are present. Parents. parents. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, how much time do we have left? 11 seconds. <laughs> Take a couple of minutes. Go ahead. I'm Jimmy Torres, and I live at Cheshire Wood Drive, 3671 Cheshire Wood Drive, um, Winston Salem, North Carolina, 2716. I work for the city, uh, I mean, for the state of North Carolina as a assistant technology instructor. And I moved here uh, to this location with my family nine years ago just to uh, raise our kids, you know, have four kids. And um, I really um, like the area and I, I, f I feel that it's very safety for us and for my kids. Our, our kids and they uh, bring their uh, friends to play okay and they enjoy it so we cannot tell them now you know go to another place to to play or to hang out with your friends um, just to respond to something that I hear earlier with a lady uh, the developer and lady uh, she said that she uh, uh, meeting, uh, have a meeting with us a few evenings ago. She only meet, uh, meet with us two nights ago. So few doesn't mean two. Because uh, even though that I, I'm, English is my second language, I'm not stupid. And I really know what is few and what is, you know, uh, two. Um, then 
she didn't mention safety. She said that we uh, bring some of the problems, and one of the problem was, you know, the uh, cloud uh, bringing so many people to area. Uh, but safety, safety is my first point. Uh, she said that she will uh, scream. Uh, I mean, check the background of those people, and she can do that as a management, but she can know check the background of all the people who would be visiting and passing by those properties. Um, also, that will bring a lot of um, illegal activity to our neighborhood that now is safe. And I really would like to um, petition, you know, that this uh, proposal do not pass. Um, also, we don't have fence up front. Uh, it can be, you know, those cars that are feeding, bring, coming from the Charlotte Drive. They can, you know, make a collision on our houses, and we don't feel safe. And our property will be devaluated at the same time, and we don't have to even uh, all the show or all the place to, to, to go <coughs> because we're paying, you know, Morgan. So um, i really concerned about that as well. And I, I also we like to say that um, we don't have uh, much time to d discuss all of these. You know, we, we, time is, is, is very important. So I'm going to leave it to the commission to evaluate this situation. <coughs> okay. Thank you, sir. I'll now declare the public hearing closed. Where does Chester Woods uh, Drive, uh, where does where's, where's that go out to? Uh, I think Gary can put up a map that shows a larger area so you can see the larger street pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, typically what will happen is there'll be as many folks well, coming from Cheshire Woods yeah. to Renault right. through here right. as going the other way. Right. It's going to be a that's right. reason for the connectivity. You know. Oh, okay. But it wouldn't be feasible not to connect it then. I mean, that sounds like their main complaint is they don't like they don't want the traffic. <coughs> well, the ordinance doesn't allow us not to connect it yeah. unless there's some... Well, that's to the yeah. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead, Gary. <laughs> Paul, was your question where Cheshire Woods? Well, can you pull up a large? I need a large map to see. Does it come out on Chatelon somewhere? Does yeah. the street yeah. Yeah. system all the way? I think up. I, I think I know where it comes out, but I just want. To All right, this is uh, what we got. This is um, Morningside here, and this is Chatelon here. So there's Cheshire Woods. Okay. It's intersection. Is that? Yeah, that's that what, what you're saying. <coughs> so I mean, there going to be there will obviously be folks from this development that would go out there to Chatelon, yeah. okay, yeah. but. There'll probably be as many or more from Cheshire come through here to get to Renault, too. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's right. And that's that's what the you, theory of connectivity. That's right. Connectivity. You spread it out. Right. You don't yeah. focus it at one intersection. Exactly. Yeah. I think, ask Gary, didn't you say you had some more information yeah. on connectivity? Maybe you could share that with us. <clears throat> yeah, just real, real briefly, this is an aerial photograph taken in 2000 uh, before. Um, Cheshire Woods uh, was approved in 2000 uh, with 41 lots, and then Esquire Place, just to the north, was approved in 2001 with 42 lots. So this is this is the way it looked about 15 years ago. Um, because when the Morningside development was was approved and, and developed, most of the homes there, similar to Hartford, were developed along, along there in 1960, uh, 1960 or so. Um, there was a stub street there, Squire Road. So when Chatelon was approved, there was a stub street there connected up to Morningside. When Morningside was developed, there was a stub street there right in between those two homes. Because that was done, these properties now have access. So when they want to go to Chatelon, maybe over to the Murray Chatelon Shopping Center, they don't have to get out on, on uh, Rinalda Road, go over here, and, uh, and get involved in this, is, in this heavy intersection here of Chatelon and Morningside, drive by all these people's homes, they can go straight through there. Now, that was not a wonderful windfall for these people, but they bought a home beside a platted open street, and eventually, 10 or 15 or 20 years later, that street connected. So uh, street connectivity absorbs and diffuses traffic. 
rather than concentrating on a few streets which are overburdened and keeping some streets which are underutilized. The city has to pay to maintain and, and pay them the same amount. Um, also, <coughs> Cheshire Woods was able to get access here because when Hartford was developed, there was a potential for a stub laid out. So again, that was, that was connectivity that was, that was built into this development. Uh, this is an image I showed earlier. This is looking north on Hartford there at the intersection of Maverick. Uh, these homes, again, were built around 1960. You can see some of the newer homes in the background here of Cheshire Woods. Uh, this street is 22 feet in width, the same width as Cheshire Woods. Uh, it does not, however, have curb and gutter or sidewalks. Uh, Cheshire Woods does not have sidewalks, but this does not have curb and gutter. So kind of the downside of not having connectivity is all the, the residents within uh, Cheshire Woods and Esquire, when they want to go to Renolda, they have to go by these homes. So all those, these homes were, were here decades prior to, they've seen their traffic and speed significantly increase because there's no other way to go. So this would provide another opportunity uh, for connectivity. Uh, going back to the site plan, uh, smaller image here, you see where Cheshire Woods intersects with the property. Uh, the developer has agreed to a third traffic calming uh, device. Uh, earlier I mentioned as you come into the property across from Pratt, you're basically driving into a parking lot with head-end parking on both sides, which is inherently a traffic calming because <clears throat> you're thinking about people crossing the road, uh, pedestrians and cars backing in and out, parking, so you're psychologically naturally going to slow down there. Uh, and then you have a 90-degree turn where they mentioned putting the, um, the, the sign and the, um, the guardrail. You have a 90-degree turn to the left, so you have to come to a stop situation. And the third traffic calming element, which they have agreed to and which is uh, preferable as per the Public Works Department, is there's about an eight-foot band that's required between a transition between a private street and a public street. Uh, the petitioners have agreed to in install a speed table there, not a speed bump, but a speed table. Uh, so that would be really three uh, horizontal and ver vertical measures of traffic, traffic calming. Will some of these residents head north through here to access Chatelon? Yes. Will maybe some general public members do that? Possibly. I would imagine more of them are probably familiar with going through Hartfield, Hartford and would continue to do that, but it would be a, a possibility. Um, but we see it as a great benefit allowing the traffic to be dispersed throughout the, the neighborhood rather than concentrating it on just a few streets. Uh, let's take just a closer look here at the development. This is Cheshire Woods Drive and Cheshire Place Drive. And here over here you have Hartford. Um, you have two, two primary intersections here. So let's just take theoretically, uh, heaven forbid, that there be some sort of major interruption at the flow at these intersections. It could be a um, a utility water break where they have to work on lines there. It could be a, a traffic accident. Uh, maybe one of these houses catches on fire. It's their major fire vehicles, by the way. Uh, I heard about the fire trucks earlier. With these streets connecting, the water lines will be connected. So the fire department will not have to go down there and blow out that water line, that fire hydrant anymore, because the water lines will be connected. But if there's major intersection problems here, and somebody down on one of these streets needs to get police service, needs to get to the emergency room, their access could be cut off. I mean, that's, that's a rare situation, but it's a real possibility. So with another access point onto Renolda, that takes care of that issue. So uh, not only from a service delivery standpoint of mail delivery, garbage, um, uh, school bus, but also just from general public safety, fire and police, connectivity makes a difference. And could you pull up the site plan one more time, well, Gary? Before you leave the site plan, can I ask a question about this picture? What neighborhood is that to the left of Cheshire, where Cheshire Place Drive ends? That's Providence Point multifamily. Okay, and why is it that the UDO didn't require that the road continue? There's about a 10-foot grade there. There's a retaining wall there, so that gotcha. was a decision made when that was approved that they could not connect. Makes sense. Thanks. Sir, yes. Sir, I'm sorry. Can I add one more answer to your question? That's relevant to Providence Point, please. Um, Come to the microphone, please. Okay. So that area that you just pointed out, while that was uh, probably uh, exempt from connectivity because of what topography issues, mm -hmm. there is another entryway on Morningside Drive, which is sort of up the hill, and Providence Point was supposed to have 
connectivity to that road somehow or another I'm not really sure how it was accomplished but there is a road there for em emergency purposes however it is closed to the general public there's a fence there there's a no trespassing sign so it's not utilized in the way that they are now asking to utilize our property one of the things that we did suggest at the meeting was perhaps they could make that same consideration for our community sounds like that's a private road because I know of one near my neighborhood where that is the case as well where it's blocked off yeah but this doesn't sound like it is a private road that's the case girl well, the difference, too, is that there's a public street stub that came up to this. There was no stub involved in that. That was a oh. proactive Safety. extension of a driveway up there to have a second emergency access. Yeah. Okay. And in response to, the, to that, as well as uh, the earlier uh, mention of what happened to Maverick or the Morningside community when Cheshire Woods was developed and I'm sure they did have concerns before the uh, development of Cheshire Woods the difference here and, and I do understand your divide and conquer sort of uh, approach here but the difference is that the existing community was opening their homes to other single-family homes not 62 apartments I think that's a significant difference, and again, uh, I don't think that the correlations that he's making, um, I don't think that they stand. Thank you. Uh, another concern that I heard had to do with uh, lack of uh, uh, places for walking and bicycling and that type of thing. What is the closest green, greenway access? from that area. Hmm. I'd probably have to defer to the residents. Bernolda. Well, uh, closest greenway access to Park Park on Renolda, uh, the Bethabra Greenway down down at the down the Lowman's Plaza. <coughs> and Old Town Park, Park. Recreation Park. Well, yeah, yeah, that one. I was I was specifically speaking to uh, yeah. Greenway. Yeah, Greenway, yeah. And our children can't walk to the No. 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 I have a comment. Okay. I hear and feel what y'all are saying, and um, I want you to know that um, that I hear your concern um, about this, and it's a lot of fear of, of the unknown or what you fear of what you perceive will happen. Um, however, when we look at this and some of the issues, we say this wouldn't happen in a more affluent area or something. I remember the apartments that came in by Century Oaks over off of Meadowlark. There was huge opposition, and that was approved. So it does, it may not happen in every neighborhood, but it is, you know, I, I think we strive to look at equity in every situation, although it may not sometimes appear that way, but I think it is something we do take into consideration. Um, diversity of housing, when you talk about diversity of neighborhood, there's also diversity of housing choices. Some of the things I'm just going to tell you from my perspective what I like is I do like the sidewalks that actually will give you a place to walk to go out on Renolda, although Renolda is not a very comfortable place to walk when you've got cars going that fast. I'm excited that there's shopping that you could access, but no one dare try to cross that street. It's as dangerous as I'll get out, but that's a whole other issue. Um, so there's some things I really like about this. I really do like the connectivity, and I know I hear all the concerns about the negative things, but there are some positive things from a public safety point of view, and giving it's something we really strive for in our long-term planning is connectivity. Um, I like to think of, I think of sidewalks this way, not necessarily roads, but they're, they, they, the sidewalks in here will help people, I think, in your neighborhood, but they do t tend to tie communities together. Um, I do encourage you all to talk to your council member if you have not all have done that. And I don't know if you already have a current neighborhood organization. This may get you to form one. <laughs> but I think it's always important for uh, communities to always be aware of what's going on and be involved if an area plan was just done. I hope some of you participated because the best way to do this is to be proactive and say, this is what we want in our community. Let your voices be heard before the fact. Um, that being said, though, there's a lot of things I like about this. When we talk about transition, you look at the growth that's coming, 120,000 new people to our community, where are we going to put them? Along a corridor like this, it makes sense to me to put apartments to transition to single-family housing. Um, it may not feel that way to you, though. Um, but those are just some of my thoughts. 
I'm going to have to support the neighborhood on this one. I think I, the one thing I do think is as we increase density, it needs to be close to certain amenities. And I'm not convinced that these are close. And I'm also not convinced that the projections for 120,000 more people are that on. We've actually seen a, quite a bit of slowing down in our growth. But uh, I think we have to be focused as to where we're putting density. And I, I, I'm not quite sure that this one sits well with me. I, too, am going to move to support the residents of the community out of the fact that I'm concerned for the safety of the children. It's my biggest heart. I was an educator, as some of the residents of the community know, for over 12 years. And I do have some issues with uh, just the increased traffic, the type of traffic that may become speedy in spite of the proposed um, bumps, if you will, that are going to be placed. Um, those don't always prevent people from speeding. So I'm going to move to support the residents of the community. I have a question for Gary. <clears throat> if the developer, looking at this particular um, shot, if you will, if the developer chose to end development at the end of whatever the road is that, that connects with Renolda and not connect with Cheshire Woods Drive, is that even an option? Well, that would be a, a city council uh, decision. Again, the ordinance requires connectivity, as I've mentioned before, unless there's a couple of exemptions, such as topography. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying is that all the apartments are, I don't have the mouse, <laughs> I'm using my hand, but... They, they, from a technical standpoint, yeah. yes, the initial plan that they brought in, which other than the connection, met UDA requirements with some minor tweaks that they've done, did not have that connection, and that was that was fine. No, so it's, it's, it's not it, what it's at. The, the problem is we can't certify that it meets the UDA requirements if, the, I mean, the, they own the property, if you don't they're, have they're developing the property. So if they, they own the property, property, it has to connect. If they own the property, we can't just segment it off and kind of ignore that the other part is there. That's the developer's property to work with, and as long as they're proposing this and you have the UDO requirement, that's, that's why we've got to have it connected. Good. Could you, could you ask your question again? I, I want to make sure that, that we're understanding what you're asking, because I think I understood your question one okay. way, and I think they're understanding it another. Let's say the development had nothing to do with Cheshire. It just had the, the same 62 units, but the drive that came in off of Renolda stopped at the end of the last building. I misunderstood, but I thought you were asking the opposite, if they only came in from Cheshire and did not have the connection out to university. Or Renolda. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ronaldo. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was that was basically what I was <clears> talking <throat> about. But they, the, that's UDO requirement. So the UDO requires that if there is an adjacent, that was my understanding, and, and that right, Paul, yeah. right. public okay. sub street. So yeah, that would that has would, to be. That, okay, I think that that would solve. You know, that would help yeah. the neighborhood, and but, but they don't have the option to do that. If they if they develop that land, they have to connect. That's what you're saying. Yeah, there's basically three options the UDO provides to not having to connect to Stub Street. One is if the road you're connecting to is less than 18 feet in pavement width, which mm -hmm. Cheshire Woods is more than 18 feet in pavement width. Number two is if there's topography, a stream, kind of like we pointed out on the mm -hmm. item on consent agenda, where it's unreasonable to make that connection, that's option two. We know that's not the case here based on the topography and the layout. Option three is if... <coughs> is if the road you're connecting to, if in the opinion of the transportation director, if the traffic you're putting on it puts that road over capacity, then that's option three that you can be let out of. And our public works director has looked at this and said that's not the case. So we've looked at the three options that allow that to be taken out, and they don't meet any of the three criteria. So since connectivity has to happen, and if I read this correctly, at least some representatives from the neighborhood would be okay with less than 40 units? Is that an option that the petitioner would consider? Oh, they have to ask them. Yeah. You won't work with the sellers are marketing that property. You won't want to answer. We need to Please come to the mic. I'd love to hear it. Just financially, it makes sense. Gotcha. For our development, um, that's not really an option because of really the way the sellers are marketing that property. Mm -hmm. you know, they're looking at it as it's a good place for commercial or multifamily. Okay. So for us to limit the units to that amount, um, it wouldn't work not with enough. their okay. their price. 
And, it, and if I could point out, when you look at the site plan, there, there has been an effort to make the temptation of a shortcut as inconvenient yeah. as possible. Mm -hmm. And I really want to emphasize what Gary said. You've got head-in parking, mm -hmm. which creates lots of friction and obstacles that slow things down. Then you've got to make an entire left turn there. And then it's sort of a circuitous uh, road up there, so it's not really a straight shot. Right. Now, by comparison, if this remained zoned RS9 and you had a developer come in and want to develop this for single family, just like the Cheshire Woods area mm -hmm. did, they would by right uh, be able to extend that road. In fact, they'd be required to extend that road from Cheshire Woods Drive all the way over to Renolda. So the road would be there. It's just the it would be a single family rather than multifamily. Did they go for the single family? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They would I, go for that. Yeah. I want to make another comment. You know, from my perspective, planning perspective, connectivity is a good thing. And I just want to say when looking at the numbers again from the report, if you built the houses as is, there's going to be um, 373 trips per day. And with this, it'd be 412. What did we say? 39 trips a day different. What I worry about, too, are the children in this apartment complex. We are responsible for each other and each other's children. When you have that head-in parking, and I saw where the tot lot is, is, you know, I think it's everybody's going to have to watch out for each other, whether you're on Cheshire, Cheshire going that way or this way. But, but again, to me, from a planning perspective, Connectivity is a good thing, and I know that sometimes we view it as, for a variety of reasons, it's not good, but it, to me it's a good thing. You right. know, another thing, too, if you put a single-family uh, development in here, it's more than likely the houses will be right up on it in Alder Road. And who want, you know, like you said about the traffic, uh, Lynn, I mean, you know, I wouldn't want to live on Renalda Road as far as, you know, living there in a, in a single-family home. I think, I think what's proposed here, whatever, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I know the connectivity, and I hear the neighbors and whatever, and, and like you, I can sympathize with them. But I, I think this is the best thing that's proposed. I mean, you know, as a planning board, we look at every angle, and the planning staff, they look at more than we do. And uh, But I, whenever a zoning comes through like this or whatever, if, if, if you get a lot of opposition or whatever, you know, I look at what's the best thing to put there. You know, we talk about going from commercial to multifamily to single-family homes, and that's what we have here, exactly that. And uh, legacy, uh, that, that's what the legacy plan wants. And I just think that this is, I know I'm probably going to be booed at, but I'm going to make a motion to approve it. Okay. That's a motion for approval. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Mitchell. Discussion? I just want to say to the residents, you talk to your council member and get them involved. Well, we have, and we can keep it going. Well, I just, in looking at this, and you compare with what's possible now versus what changes would make, I keep coming back to that 39 trips per day. And with what, I think you put it a very good way, an inconvenient shortcut, that combination of the impact to me is not significant enough to turn down a good development uh, that goes along with our plans and the way we've been supporting development in the areas. for the, And that's why I'm going to support it. But it's um, difficult when you go through changes in your immediate area, what, what you feel safe, what you feel comfortable with. And um, I think you really need to look at what the actual impact the change will be. And you're, you're absolutely right. I think that also that you know, we have a developer that has a proven track record of keeping their property up, and it's it's uh, uh, that, that's a that's something that I look at too. Is you know, they're going to be here the long for the long time for the long period, and look after the property. I mean, they got an investment in it, and not to say that the, the, the uh, single family people do not have investment also, but uh, I, I really, I honestly think that this is the best deal, and I think it'll all work out. Any other comments, discussion? Since we're still talking, I'm ready to vote, but since we're still talking, I agree that connectivity and density are a big deal. However, I always am concerned about the residents. And when there's this much um, opposition, and I haven't heard anybody but, but developers who don't live around there uh, speak out in favor of it, I'm leaning against it. However, 
in the point that you made was if the way that it is now, there can be single family development and it's only 39 trips fewer, if that's the case. So that has to be considered. But if I live there, I wouldn't want anything. <laughs> So it's easy for me to say that. <laughs> this is, well, you know, this is nothing new. You know, right. we've been yeah. for 40 years. I lived on a dead end street. Yeah, so do I. Basketball at the end of it, mm -hmm. played in the road all year long. Yeah. And, you know, and then my area turned less rural and yep. more suburban. Yep. And we've imposed upon developers for at least 40 years the requirement to put stub streets into va adjoining vacant parcels. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept has been that connectivity is a good thing. You know, that's, and it's a change. There's no question. It's a painful change. You think you're buying at the end of a cul-de-sac when you see a stub street connected to forest. You think it's a cul-de-sac. Well, it ain't. It's a, it's a stub. It's a required right. stub street. And, you know, about kids playing a road and, you know, you're worried about kids getting run over and stuff like that. There's no question about it. You know, the increase in traffic is going to increase the risk. But it's a, it's a transition from a, a cul-de-sac, what was thought to have been a cul-de-sac, but was not, in fact, a cul-de-sac. It's a transition from a, a neighborhood connected to an unimproved parcel to a neighborhood that's now going to be connected to an improved parcel. Whether it's single-family residential or whether it's multifamily is not going to change the ability of people to cut through there, the amount right. of traffic. This is a superior design to what the cheapest type of single-family development you can do through yep. there is. This is a superior design. So. You know, it's, the change is tough, but we spent we spent decades on developing public policy in a non-emotional, cool environment, and you know that's. Yep. Well, and one observation I'd make too: the option is not just strictly single-family or multifamily. Given the right. development along an older road, mm -hmm. uh, a highway business uses mm -hmm. adjacent to that all up and down there, so you could be coming in. Some with a commercial use that would create even more traffic and more of a hardship on those folks if they're trying to get from Chatelon over to it. So, uh, this point. And I, I, I apologize for jumping in because mm -hmm. this is your time to discuss, but I do want to just say something to set the record straight. Uh, I just want to point out when you're talking about, because uh, reference was made to Buena Vista and other areas, when you look at Buena Vista, right there, Robin Hood and College Village. You've got multifamily that feeds directly oh, yeah. into single-family streets in there. So you have that kind of situation there. In Ardmore, you have the apartments along Queen Street that are right across from single-family homes that feed into the same street pattern. Mm -hmm. Meadowlark and Robin Hood, I think uh, Lynn mentioned that a little bit ago. You have a single-family neighborhood and a multifamily neighborhood where the street actually was connected there. And then Brookberry Farm, which is right near there, the master plan for that calls for multifamily and single family directly flowing into each other. So it, there really is, is not an effort to try to treat one area different than another. That's, that's something that happens in, in all areas. This is consistent with I, most planning principles of going from the commercial to the multifamily, to the single mm -hmm. family. I mean, it's a traditional use. Well, but Paul, in, in that conversation you bring up, so you bring up where, where kind of my point is. For instance, in Ardmore, you you very close to parks. You have sidewalks. You have Harris Teeter. You you do have a, a very good reason for the density of of those apartments being near single family homes. <coughs> Similar situation in Buena Vista. There's restaurants. There's a restaurant right there. There's plenty of areas to walk. I, my concern about this area is exactly what she said, is putting density where there's a lack of amenities that to support that density. That, that's my personal concern. Mm -hmm. To me, when I keep saying we have to focus our density, it, to me the density needs to be focused in areas where, one, close to the job areas, and where there's amenities to support that density. And the reason I can't support this is I don't feel like this area has, at this time, the amenities to support additional density. I, I, I just, that's just taking the connectivity aside because I do support the, <coughs> connect, the connectivity. I, I think that the more connected our streets are and, and that type of thing, the better we are as a community. But I just, I question continuing to put density in areas where <laughs> I just don't feel the amenities are there to support it. And that's why I can't support this particular Do thing. Do you think the parks come before the 
the housing? I mean, the demand, the, the bodies in housing. Not necessarily. I, I don't know if I agree with you on that. Okay. okay. Any other discussion on this? If not, we have, we have a motion for approval. All in favor? Opposed? Passes 5-3. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You'll have an opportunity also with the city council meeting, of course. All right. I guess we're to the uh, area plan update. Okay. Um, we'll let the room clear a second, and then uh, uh, Marilyn, Monica, John, I think we'll walk you very briefly through the uh, changes in that. <laughs> to the restroom, too. <laughs> Good evening. I just want to um, briefly um, let you know what is the latest with the Walkertown area plan. Um, the, walk the plan was adopted by the Walkertown Town Council on the 27th, and so with just a couple small changes. So I'll just show you what the, um, the changes are. The main change that was made from the proposed land use that we um, showed you in the last presentation was the site that you see here um, called Site 1. And this site, and I think I mentioned it last time, but they would consider changing that from the proposed um, attached um, residential um, use that we had proposed there adjacent to the activity center, which is outlined here in black. And it is just south of the activity center, and they have um, proposed that it be changed to commercial <coughs> use. Um, most of the site, 6.4 acres, is in the town, and then you have a small part of the site, just this little area here, 1.8 acres, that is commercial use. So that is in the county. So in fact, um, that would be one of the, um, the, that would be the main change, in fact, that would affect the county. Um, they made one other proposed change to the um, um, land use, the proposed land use, and that is along Darrow Road. We had proposed some office um, <coughs> conversions, conversions from residential use to office use and, and um, sort of residential scaled um, commercial use. And that was, in fact, in the 2006 plan. They were a bit concerned about it now. Um, and so they asked that we remove that and leave it in um, single family residential use. So the, uh, but all that site is in the... Um, the town, it's not in the county, but it just changes our overall um, proposed land use plan. So basically, we have um, other amendments were, that were made with just some small amendments to the text where they ask us to include like school capacity and uh, enrollment and projected enro enrollment, which we got from the school board and some other s um, small changes like that, and uh, asked us to include a some text explaining a new map that we are included in the plans, which is the proposed change of use map, and which um, we have done. So those really are the changes. This shows the new um, proposed land use map with just those two changes on it. Basically, um, that is, is where we are at with it. So your presentation to the county commissioners will include those changes that the Walkertown Council approved for the town of Walkertown? Yeah. We, we will we make will. reference to it, but what yeah. the county would be adopting, just as we're talking right. to you about, is just what's the in county the county jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Right. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that's going to change is this 1.8 acres right. on right. ours. Okay. Right. Right. Which is I, a little triangle right. at the, yeah. at the yeah. back so. end of the property that was in their town. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I just mentioned it because it, it sort of changed our map. The other proposal <clears> just changed the land uses on our map in those yeah. two ways. I don't believe it's necessary to have a public hearing on this today. Look no, like you've, the, you've already I, had I, I know, unless right. Margaret is about one to speak. So. Yeah, anyway. that's right. <laughs> okay. Right. So uh, with that, uh, we need to make a recommendation for the county commissioners on the Walktown area plan. So does anyone care to we make move, I would move that we would recommend they approve it. According to what Walktown yeah, recommended. As one change. Yep. As, as amended. Right. Motion, Mr. Lamb. Second, Mr. Mullen. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. So you can't sit here so long to do that. 
<laughs> committee reports. Uh, no committee report. Okay. How about staff report? No staff report. Get out I, of here. I do have one thing. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that's all right. Since I made her stay, uh, I feel like uh, I need to introduce. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, Jeff uh, Vaughn is now the senior field uh, zoning inspector, so he's no longer in plan review. So we hired uh, Donna Guppy to okay. take his place, and she, uh, she's been a 10-year nine tenure employee of inspections and then also for those of you he doesn't come to these meetings very often but fred holbrook uh, who was the other zoning plans examiner has been uh, hired to take joe cube's place in the front office as commercial plans coordinator and we've actually hired desmond to take his place wow. <laughs> um, so anyway i just wanted uh, to introduce them to you because uh, obviously desmond will c continue being here doing some cases but he's also going to have responsibilities and in inspections and donna will be here from time to time as well so i wanted to uh, let y'all know of those changes in the staff okay. and the uh, difference difference for desmond is that he was he came in here in a temporary <coughs> position this is a permanent position Excellent. right so we're going to keep him we're very that's glad <laughs> to have him here so anyway. all right very good wow that's super <laughs> work, you worked yourself right into a job. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything, board members, anything for the good of the order? Mr. Morgan? Yep, motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Everybody have a happy Easter.